So we brought the video up to the Air Corporation, but I, I want to make these videos as entertaining as possible. So I want to go back to when I was in at GE Nuclear. Now, like I said, they, they were going to put me in another contract, and it was at uh, Corning Fiberglass, another big company down at Riceville Beach. And uh, so I was real excited. I was like, man, I get to stay here because I didn't want to go away. I love living at the beach. In fact, that's why I love living in Florida. And uh, so I went into the interview, and uh, this guy, he's sitting across from me, and uh, I, on the way in, I got to see that they had some really advanced computer systems. And I was like, well, this could be a really cool job, you know. But uh, I came in, and we sat down, and I, he, I said, you know, of course, we're going to talk about the job, my qualifications, you know, the, the regular interview that you get. And uh, he says, well, we're hiring you as a, to program in Fortran. Now, if you didn't know, I, I, I hate Fortran. <laughs> It's, it's a dead language. You probably never even heard of Fortran. It's a dead language for a reason. It's a terrible computer language. It was it was actually created for mathematicians. It was never created, but everybody tried to adapt it into all things, sorts of things that the language was never intended to do. And then you, you would get these, because uh, I had to debug. In my career, I've had to debug uh, or rewrite Fortran programs. In fact, uh, that was one particular contract. Good Lord, I forgot about this one. I was working at the Naval Research. Oh, <laughs> now, now I got to go back in time. Oh my God! All right, so I was working at the Naval Research Laboratory. This is a fun story. This is another contract. By the way, I love that job. I mean, we actually got to go out on the Chesapeake Bay, and we would shoot shaft up into the air, and, and uh, we had all this measuring equipment. Uh, and I, the guy I was working for was a, a engineering genius. Uh, it's always good to work with somebody a hell of a lot smarter than you are. And, uh, and he respected my side of the, the equation because, you know, obviously I knew computers and I knew everything about them. And we, we were a good team. Uh, I didn't hold a candle to his intelligence. I mean, this guy, I mean, he, if you've ever seen all of the, the uh, oscilloscopes and, you know, all the stuff that they make in the movies, I mean, he knew how to use all of that equipment. It was amazing watching him work. And, uh, and so we would, we would go out and we'd take all the measurements and come back. And, uh, and so this was the first time in my career that I got to use my physics because I had to program in, uh, you know, calculating the area underneath the pressure curve because that's one of the variables that we have to determine if the pressure is too great or too little, you know, then those, those rounds were disqualified. And it's a big deal for the, uh, for the computer, I mean, the uh, weapons manufacturers because if we fail a lot, uh, that costs them a lot of money. So, you know, it doesn't take but a couple, two or three rounds that were bad. Uh, for us to fail the whole lot and uh, so they didn't like that at all so oh howdy. so we uh, uh but that you like I said i really enjoyed it but then the manager his name was wayne <laughs> he calls me into his office hey kirk uh why don't you uh rewrite this uh this program and this is not because this is once once again it, it was written in fortran but it had been written by an engineer who didn't, knew nothing about programming so you had variable names i know this doesn't mean anything to you but you had variable names like a a a b b b c you know uh whatever i mean nothing didn't tell you i mean debugging or rewriting this program was a gosh dang nightmare and uh but what i did i i rewrote it and it took me well i want to say oh six months at least maybe longer and uh and i finally but it was fun because you know what was what was funny was when i would run my my version of the program i would take all the computing power of the computers <laughs> so everybody started complaining every time kirk runs his program because i got to test it right and it, you know we we don't have any computing power and uh and I, I i you know wayne called me in he says i said well we can downgrade the priority on the process i said it just takes a lot longer to run i said I'll, I'll be happy to do that and so i did that but even then it it was still churning away all the the the, the tape drives you know back then it was the old tape drives with the, the magnetic tape and i was using all of that and uh, it was fascinating i was like a, and of course i you know once again i walked in this little computer and by the way it was if you can imagine you know i, I they stuck me in a little it wasn't even an office i mean i was <laughs> I was in, in a little warehouse area uh, with a, you know, just basically a, a concrete floor underneath me. And uh, they actually had like a, a, a 
partition in front of me and all sorts of uh, electronic equipment was stored all around me. I mean, it was like a, being in a dusty, moldy basement. <laughs> but I loved it. I loved it. I mean, you know, because nobody bothered me. And I, they knew I knew what the hell I was doing. But anyway, so finally, I got the, uh, the graphs to duplicate. Now, uh, what we were trying to do is Wayne wanted to replace. There was a, another uh, a data general operation that whenever we would have to send them the data and it would take them, oh, I don't know how many computing hours for them to process the data. And, uh, and so it took, it took forever. Uh, and these were the old data general, outdated computers. Uh, I mean, because we had the more advanced, this was VAX again. Uh, we had much more advanced uh, uh, VAX computers. And, uh, and so what would take them six days to process with a team of, you know, 16 computer engineers and everything else? Well, my program did it in an hour. <laughs> so, so Wayne, I said, Wayne, we got it. I said, I've duplicated everything. Well, what Wayne didn't tell me was the manager of the other shop, uh, the Data General Computers, he was a GS-15. Well, Wayne was only a GS-13. Well, in the government, that means that the other manager outranked Wayne. And so, just to tell you how government works, you know, when that manager found out that I, because I would have replaced his whole team, right? You know, but a manager gets paid based on the number of people they manage in the government. So that's, that's why the government just grows like a blob. It just grows and grows and grows because it's not about how competent it you are. It's the number of people you have working underneath you. Well, if he lost 16 employees, or they got, you know, switched over to another department, he loses all his power. So he came down on Wayne. He says, I want this guy fired. And uh, so finally, Wayne called me in, and, I, and I, he, he goes, uh, he says, I got to let you go, Kurt. I mean, he didn't fire me. He just says, I got to let you go, you know. I got to tell your contract company, you're, you're, we're terminating your contract. I said, what the hell, Wayne? I said, I, dang it, I did everything you asked me to do. He says, well, politics. He says, that's all I can tell you. I said, yeah. I said so I, and I finally pieced it all together. I said, it was because I wrote that program, isn't it? He says, well, I, all I can tell you is that program will never see the light of day. I was, I, I'm hurt because you know, it's like being an artist and you've created the Mona Lisa and somebody takes the Mona Lisa and sets fire to it and buries all that work. You know, you've, you've poured your heart and soul six months of your life, and you're, you're so proud. I mean, you've, you've deciphered, you know, I basically was like looking at hieroglyphs. <laughs> you know, nobody had ever seen them before at some point, right? Somebody had to figure out how to decipher that. And you finally figure it all out, and you, you tell people, what's written on these cave walls means this, that, and the other. I finally broken the language. And then they say, well, no, don't worry about it. Uh, we're not, you know, we don't, we don't want to know what it said. So that was, uh, I know I went back in history there, uh, but we'll bring it up to, to Lear now. So I've taken this job at Lear Corporation as a Unix Systems Administrator. I'm excited. Now this was a great job. Don't get me wrong, and I loved working. Unfortunately, one of the guys that I worked for, he had developed his own, a lot of computer people, what they do is they work themselves in to be uh, the essential you know, it's kind of like uh, Madeleine Albright said that the United States is the essential nation. Well, that, that wasn't true <laughs> then or now, but, but I mean, but you can, in, if in the computer world, you can engineer things in such a fashion that you're indispensable because nobody else can figure it out, right? If they fire you, then who's going to manage the system if you're not around? And so this guy, and he was brilliant. Don't get me wrong. I mean, to do this, you have to be brilliant. And uh, he had completely uh, developed a whole new Unix operating system based on uh, uh, stuff that he had written, uh, all kinds of scripts and every, I mean, it was complex as hell. Uh, and so, you know, you, you're working within his environment as a Unix systems administrator, but I was mainly there to do the, uh, the, net, the backups because I, I forgot I'd done the net backup stuff at, uh, at Ford Motor when I was there. And uh, luckily the backup software, net backup had advanced and uh, that was cool. But what my real job was, and I didn't understand it, was I was there to protect this guy named Larry. And Larry, uh, 
he was dumber than a bag of stones. <laughs> I mean, I'm able to tell you. Nice guy. I mean, I didn't mind him. He, he was really weird, though. I mean, really, really weird. He, you know, he kind of one of those guys like, you know, I think he was autistic, really. I, I don't know. I mean, he had some sort of disability. And I kept wondering. But what this, this manager wanted me to do was show him everything that I was doing with the backups so that he could take over and and you know or or be my uh, partner working on the backups to keep this guy employed well it's kind of like all right look at me I, i'll tell you right now i'm five foot four do you think i'm ever going to be a professional basketball player <laughs> I mean, you know I mean, come on you know uh, or for that matter a professional football player i don't think so you know this guy was never going to be able to work on computer systems it just wasn't in his cards now the one thing that he did have where we kind of got to be friends was he was a gun fanatic and uh and of course you know i'm freshly out of or in the mil well, i might have been in the military at that time so of course we kind of took to, to each other as, as far as guns went and man i tell you what it, talent okay got to give got to give him credit where credit's due this guy knew everything about guns he could take a gun down and put it back together better than i could <laughs> here i am here I'm, now maybe not an f-16 uh, but I mean a handgun. I mean he actually had a shooting range in his basement. <laughs> so we went in there, and, uh, and he also knew how to repair. Well, he did his own ammunition. You know, fill in the bullets, uh, and he would also repair guns. So I was thinking, you know, why isn't this guy working in a gun shop? I mean that would have been a much a great career for him. But I think it was because he was so weird and so strange that probably no gun shop would hire him. And unless he had the ability to start his own gun shop, I know I digress, I digress. But anyway, that guy eventually got arrested for threatening uh, his girlfriend. And he had some weird, weird girlfriends. I mean, tattoos up the wazoo and everything. And I, I, you know, I don't know whether he was falsely accused or he pulled a gun on her. I don't know the whole story, but he ended up in jail. Let's just put it that way. Uh, I felt bad for him because I'm sure he didn't do too well in being that autistic and everything in jail. But anyway, so that what happened was uh, that I, I was trying to do other things to, to help the team and all and the manager he didn't like the fact that I couldn't help Larry and I, I don't know what happened somehow something happened with Larry and the manager called me in and he says I, I, I'm telling you to bring Larry up to speed you know what what's going on and I I, you know, I think I might have just told him, look, I mean, I, I've tried, and Larry just, <laughs> he just can't pick up on it. Well, I, I knew I, I, it was time for me to move on from that job, you know. I, I, I didn't think the writing, so I ended up transferring over to another Unix system, within the same company, another Unix systems administration team, which was a hell of a lot more fun. Uh, these guys were great, and I worked with them, and, uh, but unfortunately, once again, I made uh, two big mistakes. One time, I, I thought I was logged into a Unix terminal, all right, so I, I, I logged into a I was logged into a Linux terminal. I was using Linux. You can run Linux on a PC. A lot of people don't even know that, and I preferred Linux at that time over Windows any day. And uh, so I thought I was logged into my terminal, and I did a shutdown. Well, it turns out I had that terminal window logged into one of the the main computer systems for Lear Corporation, and I shut down a system right in the middle of uh, of the workday. And uh, and and boy, I tell you, my manager. James, he, he wouldn't, he, I, I, he wasn't happy about that. I mean, because you can imagine people probably lost work. I mean, can you imagine you're sitting there working and all of a sudden you get a message coming across the system shutting down, <laughs> you know, because there's probably a hundred people logged into that computer, you know. Oh my God, that was a huge mistake. And then the second big mistake that I made was uh, the way that things operated at the previous job was we had a three mirrored system so that you could yank the disks you could you could duplicate the disks because the, the way the software worked i can't remember what it was called citrix i want to say but anyway what you have is a, is a you have a dual mirror and a backup and so what you what we would do is you know the, of course the computer systems running on that dual mirror mirror means that you've got two hard drives that are mirroring each other and so what you could do is you could freeze an image at one point all right and say okay I uh, break the mirror apart and then you know I move it off to the side and the computer system would be running on let's say one set of hard drives and then you move the backup drives back into the mirror and that was the way it worked so you basically have three three discs and then you use the discs 
I know this sounds complicated. I'm trying to break it down for you. But you, then you back up that image of that computer system from that day because you're doing daily backups if you're a corporation for sure. You know, of course, you, all, all your, during the day you're doing incremental backups too. So you got incremental, you got daily backups, you got month, weekly backups, you got monthly backups. Being a backup manager for a major corporation is a hell of a, it's a full-time job. You can just do that all by itself. See what I'm talking about? All the many different facets of computers. And so I thought we had the same setup in Southfield. So I, I don't remember what I did, but I broke the mirror. But anyway, what happened was I yanked the hard drives right out from underneath the operating system. <laughs> I mean, that could have caused some serious damage. And oh my God, you should have seen my manager. He was hot, but we were, luckily we were able to get everything back up and running, but it could have been a major disaster. And I think, I bet he turned 10 shades of white after I did that. And I, when I say I did it, I was working with somebody else, but they didn't, they were just as dumb as I was about how the, everything worked. You know, I thought I knew because I came from the other computer center. So he was trusting my judgment. So I blame myself. I don't, I don't blame him at all. You know, he, he, he just said, well, are you sure you want to do that? I said, well, that's the way it works in Dearborn. I said, I can't imagine. Anyway, so the writing was on the wall to move on from that job. <laughs> so, although he, he, he wasn't going to keep me on. I mean, because we were, we were good friends. I went flying with the guy. We used to go up in his, uh, his Cessna and, and fly around Detroit and up the, uh, up the Great Lakes and everything. Was, so we had a lot of fun together, and uh, he didn't want to fire me. But I, what I got was the opportunity. To, to move on to work in uh, PeopleSoft. And it was, it was also a pay raise, a huge pay raise actually. And, and when somebody offers you $28,000 in free education in a whole different computer technology that you've ever worked in before, are you gonna jump all over that? I did, I jumped all over it. And so I ended up going to the PeopleSoft department, which uh, I know that if you don't understand what PeopleSoft is, that's a financial a management system well much more than that but mainly it's, it handles all the finances for the company and that was a you know after i got back and i knew all the people soft administration you know how to do upgrades uh, i mean it's very very complex and uh, luckily i had a manager and she knew the system really well so i was learning a lot from her on the people soft side but i was mainly hired for my unix skills or my scripting uh, administrative skills because uh, they wanted an administrator in there because I guess a lot of times he couldn't get what he wanted out of the Dearborn team so he wanted his own pet you know Unix administrator it was a good job but then what they did was they moved I had 10 minute commute to work uh, I could ride my bike to work when it wasn't snowing outside and, uh, and then they moved the office to Troy Michigan I didn't even know Lear had a plant in Troy Michigan well if you know my background I hated working in Washington DC because of the commute not because the work wasn't good and so I swore I, it was you know it was my worst nightmare I swore I would never ever drive an hour to two hours to work ever again in my lifetime you know if I can't live near work or have a job where you know it's a, it's a drive through the country to get to the job I don't mind driving an hour I just don't want to be in heavy traffic with people trying to make a pinball out of my car and this guy, the, the manager, was, the manager that hired me was pretty cool. But his manager, manager, making 250000 a year, was a complete asshole. And, I, you know, I had a pager. And that was another thing I didn't like about the job. I'm chained to a pager 24 hours a day. And, man, you know, you're out there at 3 o'clock in the morning in the middle of your sleep. Pager goes off. you got to go in and log into the computer. So this manager was such an asshole. Even though you worked all night long, logged in from home, he wants you to come into work and be there. I had to work from seven to three, you know, because I was trying to beat traffic. You know, you still didn't beat traffic. You still ran into a lot of traffic, even even at five thirty in the morning. You know, when I had to take off from my house, I, you know, by the time I get to Troy, Michigan, and anybody familiar with Troy, Michigan, it's horrible to drive in. So it's worse or even the same as Washington D.C. So anyway, uh, so I, I obviously I became a disgruntled employee at this point. <laughs> You know? And uh, I was, uh, I wasn't real happy with And then the other thing was on snow days, you know, uh, to, to drive up there on a snow day. You know, it, it's funny. You can work all night long from home, but you can't work from home on a snow day. You know, why not? I mean, you know, what happened with COVID was everybody started working from home, right? That's why all the office buildings are, are, are empty right now. So we found out that working from home, and actually I was a hell of a lot more productive. My computer equipment at home was a hell of a lot better than what I was using when I was in the office. But this guy was old school. He wanted you there. Well, on snow days, I was so pissed off. I said, screw it, man. They want me there. 
I'm not leaving early. I left at my usual five. Well, I, sometimes I couldn't get out of the, the, the way because my car was parked on the street. You know, by the time you push all that snow off the car and everything, and of course you got to wait for the streets to get plowed. You know, I might not get off in the, on the road until, ah, let's say, eight, eight o'clock. And of course, and then the traffic, you know, with the snow and people falling into ditches, you know, people in Michigan don't know how to drive in the snow. You would think they would. And uh, it was horrible. I had to stick to the back roads. Man, I got a fly buzzing me. Sorry about that. And uh, I said, man, you know, so I might not get to work till noon. And this manager would call, you know, he, he never called me in, but you know, you could tell he wasn't pleased. And I said, well, yeah, it was unbelievable trying to drive here in the snow. Amazing if I could, you know, I always, I, I would shout it out. Amazing if I could have worked from home, I, I would have been working for about four hours instead of driving in here in my car. You know, I, that, that doesn't go over with an asshole manager very well. And so he worked me out the door. Uh, and, but, 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 you know, that job got me a lot of experience for the book because I was handling all of the encryption for the corporation. I was also handling the Odyssey system, which is a job management system. So you can see, and then of course I did the PeopleSoft stuff. So you can see how the, the, the career just keeps getting more and more and more diverse. But mainly what that helped me for the book was writing the encryption chapter in the book. Because handling the encryption for an entire corporation, that's, uh, that's tough. Handling encryption for a small business or a home computer user, that was, that was easy and it was fun. And I enjoyed uh, writing that chapter. And I hope that people will enjoy that. The next job will be J.P. Morgan. And we'll get into that in just a minute. Uh, trying to think if there was any other stories from, uh, from that PeopleSoft job. Well, I never, I never did mess anything up there, which is amazing. <laughs> so I don't, I don't really have any good stories other than the fact that I did enjoy thumbing my nose at that manager because I would go out during lunch and go for a walk, and he was, he was the, getting paid two hundred fifty thousand dollars to walk up and down the aisle to make sure you, you sat quietly in your cube, you know, make sure that you're typing away. In fact, he put out a memo, you know, I expect everybody in their cube as much as possible. If you have to take a bathroom break. You know, here they are. They're paying me ninety thousand dollars a year. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta be careful about when I take a bathroom break. That's what, that's what this guy was like. I mean, what, what, what an asshole to work for. You can have the best job in the world, but if you got an asshole for a manager, you are just screwed. But anyway, they, they finished the story. They laid me off, and they, you know, of course, I love the, the layoff when they bring you in. We're giving you a severance package, and this is a little tidbit for everybody to get. Was uh, if, if you get laid off. Obviously, I wasn't laid off because I wasn't doing the job. They said the way they, they can work it is because uh, they and they also don't want to use age discrimination. So what, what it, all managers throw in to the kitty, uh, management comes down and says, we want to get rid of X number of people because we're shrinking the size to save money. And it's really, uh, back then, it was more or less an excuse to get rid of all the people that the managers didn't like because uh, because I know the other people that got laid off and uh, so so many from each department so they they kind of do it across the board to make it look like it's a downsizing uh, even if it wasn't try proving that you know so I did hire a lawyer and the lawyer looks and he goes well we can't get age discrimination because you got you know a variety of age groups and he says we can't get them but he, I, he says but I can get you some money on your severance package and he did it was worth it I don't know I think I paid that lawyer like a thousand dollars and he got me uh, a pretty good severance, but I lost my uh, pension because I was six months from getting my pension. And of course, my my ex-wife was pissed off because uh, she blamed me, and I did cause it to a certain degree. I mean, because I was pretty disgruntled, and you know, I I have a tendency when I'm miserable to make my my feelings known. I can't suppress them down, but I did better on my next job, which we'll talk about in the next video at J.P. Morgan Chase building a data center that was fun you can run on for a long time run on for a long time run on for a long time sooner or later god's gonna cut you down sooner or later god's gonna cut you down go tell that globalist liar that Democrat idiot writer, that rhino rambler, that nuclear war gambler, that backbiting U.S. politician, sooner or later God's gonna cut you down. Sooner or later God's gonna cut you down.